Your goal should be to be useful. You disturb your ease by doing wrong things and you call yourself diseased. To be peaceful. If a person lives based on this I, me, mine, he can never, never be peaceful. And then to be useful. Nothing will disturb you if your life is based on selflessness. And you can always be peaceful. And when you are peaceful, you are a happy person. I am fortunate, in a way, to be born in a family of pious parents. They instilled the faith in God in my heart. And somehow from then on, I never worried about anything. Everything just fell into proper places. I got my hands into everything. Automobile engineering, electronic engineering, cinematography, temple management. Our home was a place for almost all the sages and saints who walked that way. So naturally, I sat at their feet, learned a lot. Ultimately, I heard of another great saint in the Himalayas. Swami Shivananda, and that was more or less the culmination of my search. It's all naturally happened. Another filmmaker from America came and stayed in a hotel, and he was casually speaking to the owner of the hotel. Is there anybody who can teach me a little yoga? And that's how he came to know me. And we started talking, talking, talking. After three, four weeks, without even asking me, he sent me a, a ticket. The British Airlines called me and said, there is a ticket waiting. When are you going? While some young people demonstrate for peace and others seek it in the artificial solace of drugs, here in New York, Swami Sachidananda teaches another way to peace. And on Friday evenings, he helps both young and old in the age-old battle to control the mind, which is the power of yoga. It is impossible to reform outside without having that reformation within ourselves. That class, which is taught as part of integral yoga, has very profound physiologic benefits in its design. Once you learn them, even if you don't practice regularly, you can still rely on them in, in times of need. So it starts with chanting, which immediately gets you out of that left brain sort of stuck thinking. And then we do the eye exercises. The eye is the only part of the brain that you can see on the surface of the body. Up. And those pathways are there, so if you relax your eyes, Up. it has a Up. soothing effect on the brain itself. Rub your palms, feel the heat, and then cut your eyes with the palms. Feel the warmth of the palm. Then slowly bring the palm down until the fingertip touches the eyeballs. And then slowly massage the eyeballs outward. One, two, three, four, little faster. 
Then after the eye exercises in the yoga class, there's the sun salutation, which acts on all parts of the body. So that first, you get all parts of the body sort of warmed up and loosened up, and sun salutation is very powerful for doing that. 10, 11, 12, 13, 15. Then we do the backward bends first in integral yoga. They're a little harder to do, so we do them first. Elbows up. Good, good, that's good. A little more up, a little more. Not to strain much. Now, raise the arms up again. And then we relax into the forward bends afterwards. Exhale and slowly bend forward. Bend at the hip. Try to touch the toe. If you can't, hold the leg wherever you can. After we've sort of shaken and loosened everything up, turn the body upside down in shoulder stand to drain the lymph. It will look nice if it is very straight and vertical. And then we correct the neck by doing the fish, and that allows the lungs to expand more fully. Catching out the throat. Not good. Okay, see, that's where you should feel. Lift the left leg. Lift me up. And finally, to turn the body from side to side to give a gentle massage to the kidneys to get rid of any waste products that we might have generated by all this moving around in the yoga class. Right. The head, wonderful. Now, give a push here. Exhale and bend forward. So we end the yoga class which with yogic seal, where you cross your legs and bend over them, which stretches the parasympathetics at the base of the spine. If you can, bring the forehead onto the floor. Gets us prepared for the deep relaxation. If there is no tension in the body, there is no need for a heavy breathing. So the breath is very shallow. Then pranayama. Simply observe the breath. And finally, meditation, which is the most direct path to stress management. So to consciously choose to remain peaceful in the midst of our day, that meditation has a great power to do that. Now you see, you were the witness of your own body, your own breath, and your mind. If that is so, who was the one who was observing all these things? That means you are not the body, not even the vital breath, not even the mind. You seem to be a witness. That is the essential quality of the soul, the pure soul. Sattva Purushayo Shuddhi Samye Kaivalyam Iti Shri Patanjala Yoga Darshane Vibhuti Pado the literal meaning of yoga is to unite. And the root is yuj, or to yoke, to put together. But in a broader sense, uh, maintaining the equanimity is yoga. Tranquility, serenity. The Gita says, Samatvam Yoga Uchyate. Balance is Yoga. The concept of integral yoga was to bring the teachings of yoga into all aspects of our lives by showing us how yoga could be a part of the way um, we would think intellectually, be a part of the way that we would act in the world. There, there are centers spread all over the globe. And uh, it's amazing to think that these centers happened because Gurdjieff visited all these places, because he spent time there and interacted with people. Yoga teaches you to face the problem, analyze it, solve it, not to run away. In fact, what good of your yoga if it could be practiced only in the Himalayan cave? Hmm? You are no good for anything or anybody, and not everybody can do it. So, if you are a yogi, stay in the midst of the din and bustle of the town, of the city, of the life, and still maintain your equanimity. He took 
the most profound, the most sublime teachings, and he made them very simple and clear. And not only did he make them accessible, somehow he had the gift to give us the confidence that we could practice them and derive the benefits. I've seen him through the last over 20 some years of all the ups and downs around us and in the world. Never a moment he lost his peace at all. How he lived, how he spoke, what he did was integral yoga. You know, he has said many things, but the most important, he talked about the children. He said, go to the children, bring them right, so that, you know, the future world will be good. For Swamiji, because this is so spiritual, it was an expression of one's divinity. Nataraja is a king of dances, and that's a symbolic figure for Bharatanatyam. It was a way of expressing that divinity. And not only do you take yourself to a different plateau, but you help others to go there. Especially when I had to go out and teach dance. Sometimes I was in a cross road, I said, Swamiji, this is such a traditional art form. How do I go and present this to children who have no idea, who haven't even seen an Indian dancer? Present it the way they can understand. That was his teaching to me. Yoga allowed me to get my body focused on something so my mind could be freed to focus on emptiness. And so although the asanas of yoga are important, it was the deep breathing and meditative aspects of yoga that provided the deepest lessons. So these tools, which at a very basic level for a healthy human have benefit, provide an incremental benefit to folks who have illness. And in particular, if you can combine yoga with meditation, you begin to see medicinal benefits in a whole slew of different areas, in including management of arrhythmias, asthmatic conditions, uh, autoimmune problems, places where our body has gone a little bit awry and can be rebalanced and reset if we can use a tool like yoga. That's one of Swami Satchinananda's great contributions, is that he talked about the relationship of the mind and emotions to health. He talked about using more natural approaches to treatment and prevention. The, the idea that, um, that we can assist the body to heal itself as opposed to cover up a symptom. I would say that characterizes the shift toward alternative medicine and integrative medicine, complementary medicine that's going on right now. If we are simply going to treat only the people for their problems without telling them why you are in this trouble, what did you do? What went wrong? How could you avoid coming to me again? That's very important. That's what integrative medicine to me is all about. It's integrating the best of traditional and non-traditional approaches and using science to show what works, what doesn't, for whom and under what circumstances. In our studies, we use these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art measures to prove the power of these very ancient, low-tech and low-cost interventions like what we learned from uh, Swami Satchidananda. For over 20 years, Dr. Dean Ornish has been making headlines as the first doctor to prove to prove now that heart disease can really be reversed by changing your lifestyle. A vegan diet, right? Not vegetarian, but vegan, which means what? No meat, no eggs. What we found is that after a year, the men who followed a vegan diet and who also made other changes in diet and lifestyle, who exercised, who did yoga meditation, and who had a support group, that their PSA levels began to decline. Initially, I believed that if I had knowledge, then I would have the power to help and make all the differences that needed to be made. And what you realize is knowledge is power, that's for sure, but it's not all the power you'll need to help. And in fact, the solutions to, to the wellness of individuals lies within them. 
So if I take you off to the operating room with the expectation on your part that I'll cure you forever of your heart disease, and all I'm really doing is palliating your problem, then a couple of years down the road when you rec have recurrent symptoms because you're continuing to smoke or you're still gaining weight or you're not meditating, or you're just not getting in touch with life and, and sickness just becomes some obstacle to overcome to get back to the blandness of, of wellness, then we've missed the whole boat. Back in January of 1993, uh, I was working in the federal government in Washington, D.C. I was behind my desk, feverishly working on a report that was due that evening. And the next thing I knew, I found myself on my back, on the floor, with excruciating chest pain. I had a cardiologist tell me that at the age of 42, I'd had a heart attack. A couple days into the recovery, I had a friend of my wife's uh, visit me, and he brought me a book written by Dr. Dean Ornish, and the book was entitled Reversing Heart Disease. Dr. Ornish began the discussions of his interventions, his solutions to that disease. And the first one involved diet. And it was a fairly radical diet. It was entirely vegetarian. And it not just wasn't vegetarian, it was extremely low fat. Well, then I went on to the next chapter. And that chapter was a little bit strange, to tell you the truth, because it had a bunch of stick figures in it doing these pretzel poses. I was out of the hospital, and two weeks later, I visited with my cardiologist, and I asked him if he'd ever heard about this Dr. Dean Ornish and this book about reversing heart disease. And my cardiologist said, well, Dr. Ornish is kind of out there on his own. So instead, I embraced my cardiologist's recommendations. I was supposed to moderate my diet, not eat so much red meat, substitute uh, chicken, substitute fish rest for six weeks, and then go back to my normal life activities, which included working 60 or 70 hours a week in the federal government, looking at every opportunity to go up that next rung on the ladder, and I spent the next several years doing that to some relative success. I had my second heart attack three days before my 50th birthday. I'd come home frustrated, angry. I began to self-medicate with alcohol. I had my third heart attack in June of 2002. And then finally in November of 2003, I had my fourth heart attack. In February of 2005, I was diagnosed with my fifth heart attack. By that time, my cardiologist stopped offering suggestions. It was pretty clear where my disease was heading. I left that day and I told myself that there had to be some, something else that I could do to save my life. I got home later that day and that evening as I was sitting in a fair amount of despair, I remembered that book from Dean Orange. And I went through the library and dug it out and dusted it off and started reading it once again. and then read about the stick figures, <laughs> which I now knew to be yoga, and then read about the concept of opening your heart to love, which I knew also now to be yoga. And suddenly, instead of that book being so strange, it made more sense to me than anything that I'd read in my life. So from that day forward, I lived that book. I practiced a complete vegetarian diet. I exercised every day by prescription of Dr. Ornish. I practiced yoga twice a day. And slowly, week after week, month after month, I began to feel better. My energy increased. My outlook on life continued to improve. I was able to increase my time at working out. I was able to increase my asanas. I was able to go back to do some, doing the things that I was doing before in my life. A year prior, when I was going to have that implant in my chest, my ejection fraction, which is the primary test of heart efficiency, was 29. That's about half that of a normal beating heart. The ejection fraction had arisen to almost 50, which is essentially normal for a person of my age. In addition to that, the METS level, which is essentially a test 
of aerobic capacity, heart capacity. For a normal person with no previous heart disease, a METS of 10 is considered excellent. Mine was 13. <laughs> and after the shock of that wore off, another emotion came in. And the emotion was, you know, this really, this really is a miracle. What, what am I supposed to do with the rest of my life? And it was at that point that it became crystal clear to me what I needed to do with the rest of my life. And I'm now working at Augusta Medical Center teaching yoga to not only regular yoga students, we're also putting together programs for yoga for cancer patients. It's just another example of Gurudev's love and his hand on my shoulder, directing me in every aspect of my recovery and now my new life. I don't think that you can truly achieve health, certainly the health that will make you happy and glow in life without dealing with the spiritual issues. Because you have to have an insight into what it's all about. And we frequently look upon organized religion and by the way, sometimes organized religion comes in the form of science to deal with these issues for us. But at, at the end of every experience of that nature, there's always the why. You know, why is this happening? Why is this worth it? Uh, and what's gonna become of me? And we have to have some type of a congruent system for ourselves to cope with that question. And for that reason, I would never try to advise someone to take care of their body without dealing at the same time with the spiritual issues that I know they're facing, because they're human, and all humans face that issue. a lot of visibility as a major religious figure in America. He was a, a Hindu leader who wasn't just talking to Hindus about Hindu ritual. He was talking about the issues of the world, which included dealing with people of other traditions because we're now living in a globalized world. In fact, the world statistics say that more people were killed in the name of religion and God than by any other reasons. Could that be the purpose of religions who gave us the religious teachings? The Prophet, the Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, Shankara? No. Religions always have the same aim behind, same goal. And even there is not much difference in presentation, but the problem is in understanding. Then I thought there should be a a, a place huh, to remind that, huh? a permanent place. It is that idea that made me think of lotus. Huh? So I said, a shrine in the form of lotus, L-O-T-U-S. It stands for Light of Truth Universal Shrine. Huh? The first shrine which could accommodate altars for all the various faiths. So it's a physical concrete symbol to express the goal that we should get united in the name of religion. That's the purpose of religion. Let's not kill each other in the name of God and religion.
So it accommodates all the various faiths. So anybody who comes here can see it's my place. And people have all over the world come visit it and they felt so much at home. You know, this vision of this Lotus Temple, I think is more relevant today than ever because all of the things that we are so afraid of, you know, terrorism and religious wars and jihads and all of this, they all begin with that misperception that we are separate and only separate from each other. Because once we have the other half of that, which is, yes, we are separate and we are all interconnected, it becomes much harder to demonize people and to do bad things to them. Yoga gives you the foundation, then you can build anything you want over it. So it's not an escapism at all. On the other hand, it is a preparation to face the world and to make the world a happy place to live. Life is to have fun. If we want, we can always be happy. It's completely in our hands. If I can have the right attitude, nobody, I mean really nobody, on this earth or anywhere in the planet can make me unhappy. He was Swami for the people. He attracted people. He has a strong magnet, a, a, a love. He was made of love, you know. You close your eyes, you see sort of a God in him. I mean, Sri Gurudev has always said, the highest compliment that you can ever pay me, he said, is to enjoy all the happiness and joy that I experience. Which is, what are you doing this moment to realize who you are, to know who you are, to know yourself from the inside? Because that's what you get to take with you in the continuing journey. And people would ask him, what would your last words be? He would always say, see you later. <laughs> It's very simple. Keep your body as clean as possible, your mind as clear as possible. That's all we need. And do it in any way you can, in your own way. It doesn't matter. That's why I say, useful body, peaceful mind. And then you will be useful. You don't have to become a useful person. You will be useful. So if you Remember this always, you don't need me anymore, you don't even need to hear me anymore. Good idea. Thank you.